I'm Zach. And I'm Darcy. We're an LDS couple who struggled with unwanted pornography in our marriage for many years. What was once our greatest struggle and something we thought would destroy us has become our greatest blessing and triumph. Our hope is that as you listen to our podcast each week, you'll be filled with hope and healing and realize that you too can thrive beyond pornography and create the marriage you have always desired. Welcome to Thrive Beyond Pornography. We're so glad you're here and we believe in you. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Thrive Beyond Pornography. I'm your host, Darcy, and today Zach is with me. Hey, how you doing? So I thought it would be fun to interview Zach kind of speed dating style. I'm going to ask him some questions about his journey with pornography and we'll go from there. We hope that this will be a fun episode and you'll get to know us a bit better. Let's get started. Can you share a bit about your journey with pornography, including when you first encountered it and how it evolved over time? Yeah, I found porn for the first time when I was eight. We were, we were living in a place called Dugway, Utah. I found it on a playground that I was playing on. And then, you know, I, I could I found it occasionally here and there. We, li- we lived in Germany for a little while, so porn was a lot more available there. Then we moved back to the States. There were periods where I never saw porn because it didn't It wasn't at our home and this was all before the internet. So it wasn't even possible to find it into my teen years, my late teen years. And we finally got the internet when we had moved to Chicago. I still wasn't watching porn on the internet or anything like that. It was just kind of this occasional thing that happened. And I, you know, masturbation was a continual part of my life. But for the most part, I had about 25 years from the time I was eight till the time I was about 35, where I was viewing pornography and masturbating pretty regularly. But the way that it evolved was that I went from when I was a teen or young adult, it was something that was like interesting to something that really helped me manage my emotional state or manage myself in stressful moments or overwhelm, that sort of thing. So that's probably the way that it evolved the most. Okay. A lot of people always think that it escalates. Did you experience that? Like it got worse and worse and you needed more and more and more? Or what was your experience? No, it was pretty steady. I mean, I think there was... So if you're talking about escalation in terms of the type of pornography going to like harder and harder stuff, that would, that never escalated. It was very simple. I have, my preferences didn't change over time. If you're talking about volume, you know, viewing it more and more to manage myself more and more, there were periods where I used it more to manage myself, especially when I was an adult and the internet was more prevalent, but there were periods where it wasn't even really a problem. So there were these on again, off again times. But I wouldn't say that it like progressively got worse. No, it was more like I got more and more fed up with it. That's really the only thing that became more of a problem. It's like I was looking for it to stop. And I was like, why doesn't this end? Why can't I deal with this? Why can't I get rid of this? Okay. What were some of the biggest challenges you faced in trying to overcome your struggle with pornography? The biggest challenge was really that I didn't have any tools. It was very much a pray harder, read your scriptures more, use these um, non-scientific ways of dealing with your pornography struggle, use these non-mindfulness ways of, of dealing with your pornography struggle. And I'm not saying that those things aren't valuable. It's good to pray. It's good to read your scriptures. It's good to engage in you know, your moral compass in this process. But I also think if somebody had handed me a tool that I could have used to solve this problem, not only would I have been able to be more the person that I expected myself to be, but I would have been able to put porn behind me more quickly. Were there any turning points or moments of clarity that helped you on your path? Yeah, 100%. Probably the biggest turning point, the biggest moment of clarity was when I got home from, I had been at work all day. And then I went to meet with the bishop and I think I had even seen a counselor. And then I went to a later addiction recovery meeting. So like a a sex addicts anonymous or they call them ARP. The the meeting that I went to was just a bunch of people getting together saying, hey, um, you know, I, I have a porn problem, right? So I'd spent maybe 15 hours of my day away from the home. We had six children, seven and under. And you met me at the door and you're like, I don't care if you solve this problem. I need help with diapers. And for me, that was this moment where 
everything shifted from I'm solving this problem for Darcy to it's not about Darcy. It's not about doing it for someone else. It's about me saying, do I really want this in my life? And I did not want porn in my life, but I also didn't know how to solve that. And so I stopped going to all those meetings and I started to dig into what actually is working and what is proven to work. And I started to do experiments even before I knew about any of the literature that was available or any of the scientific information that was available. I started to do experiments on my own and that started to make the changes. What strategies did you find most helpful in those early years of making progress, I should say? Because I feel like in the beginning, it was very much like you were just fighting with it all yeah, the time. But. Yeah. So I, one thing I did is I stopped fighting, right? When my brain was offering me porn, it was like, okay, stop with the battle. All that battle language, all that fighting language, all that war language that we have around pornography, the only thing you're fighting with is your own brain. And there, that's a lose-lose because if you fight with your own brain and you lose, meaning you choose porn after you fought with your brain, you're number one, you're exhausted. Number two, you feel like so much more of a failure that you can never really get, like you, you never really get to a place where you feel like you want to address it. Because the more you do it, the more you don't solve it, the more you fall behind, the less good you feel about anything that you're doing in it. So you feel like addressing it is more problematic than just saying, well, screw it, I, I give up. I've worked with so many people who are there like, yeah, I eventually just got to a place where I'm like, I give up, I don't care. Mm -hmm. And that really shifted for me when I started to look at, okay, what is my brain actually trying to do here? Why is it offering me? So number one strategy was like getting really, really clear about what was going on for me mentally and emotionally before my brain offered me porn. Number two was learning how to deal with that problem that my brain was trying to avoid before my brain offered me porn. Number three was really getting open and honest and integrated with the person I was sharing with you so that when I had a struggle, I could hold on to my sense of self in the face of your discomfort around this problem because there still was quite a bit of discomfort around. Mm -hmm. And another thing that really helped me was just getting really solid and like, hey, I'm going to not let this be about her in any way. I'm going to not let my struggle, my biggest struggle, be her problem. And that was twofold, right? So it was like, I'm not going to put this on you to solve it. So it's like, I'm not going to have you managing my passwords. But the other thing was, I was not going to let you make what was going on for me about you. And that changed enormously a lot of the things that we did. And we, we worked to refine those over time. But I think those are probably, those are probably the four biggest things that changed for us. What advice would you give to someone who is currently struggling with pornography? I would start with this use every single time that you view pornography as a data point, not as a failure. If you can use every single time that you have chosen pornography as a data point instead of a failure, you'll start to see patterns and you'll start to see clues as to what you can actually deal with. And when you do that, you'll start to solve for porn. Most men are really great at pro problem solving. That's what we do at work. That's what we do at home. Use that space, use that capacity to make your mistakes or make your choices to view porn something that you can look at and dissect and deal with. All right. Can you discuss the role of shame and guilt in your experience with pornography and how you were able to overcome those feelings? I felt so ashamed of masturbation and pornography from the beginning. I was very ashamed of my sexuality. It was a, I was very ashamed of how I was approaching my sexuality because I felt like that was the message I was given. That was what I was supposed to think. I was supposed to think that these things were bad. And, you know, I think a lot of people would argue that porn is bad. And I think a lot of people would argue that masturbation is bad. But I don't think that argument holds enough water to make a difference for any, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people out there are like sugar is bad. And a lot of people out there are like too much sun is bad. But Telling people something is bad is not as effective as asking people, how do you want to be in relation with this? How do you want to deal with this in your life? 
do you want this to be a part of your life? And the more we could, I was able to move away from porn bad. And, and here's, I think, one of the things that everybody has to understand about this, right? So if I view pornography and I think porn is bad, and everybody around me is telling me that porn is bad, but I like it because it makes me feel good when I'm stressed or frustrated or lonely or depressed or tired, then the logical conclusion is that if porn is bad and I like porn, then I am bad. And that's not a very helpful framework to live your life in. So instead of worrying about whether porn is bad, like we don't have to hate something or think that it's bad to not do it or have it in our lives. Like for instance, you're a vegetarian, you don't think meat's bad, right? So instead of saying porn's bad, say, I have chosen porn in the past. How do I want to deal with it going forward? Who do I want to be? And how do I want to relate with this? Because it's a part of the landscape I live in. All right. So this is just going to be totally squirrel moment because okay. that's how my ADD <laughs> brain operates. We're and all, also, we're... and also, this is just my public service announcement. But when you were talking about like the sun's bad, it yeah. just made me think of how I've had melanoma. And when our kids come to us and I say, hey, let's get your sunscreen on. They're always like, do I have to? And I'm always like, no, you don't have to like you don't have to but let me tell you some of the reasons why you might want to yeah and i go into the reasons why they want to and then i'm like you get to decide here and then they typically make the choice to put on the sunscreen this is also your notice that if you have moles you should go to the dermatologist <laughs> once a year to get them checked to check, make yeah. sure that you're not going to die. I think that's a really great analogy in that you could use that, your experience with melanoma as an opportunity to shame your children and make them fear the sun and tell them all of the horrible things that are going to happen to them. But instead, helping them make a choice that helps them move towards their values, helping them love themselves in the face of maybe a tedious task that is coming along to put on more sunscreen. That is a really helpful way to think about the way that looking at dealing with porn can be dealt with, dealing with overeating can be dealt with, dealing with excessive scrolling, doom scrolling on your phone, all kinds of behaviors that they may not be in our value structure, but they are a part of the landscape that we live in. Mm -hmm. How has your life changed since you stopped viewing porn? Yeah, so that's a really good question. In a lot of ways, it hasn't changed much. It's not like all of a sudden porn stopped being a part of my life and everything was sunshine and roses. Like there's still disagreements between you and I. They're still dealing with kids. They're still doing work. There's still all the things that you have to do in life. And there's still all of the emotions that I was avoiding with porn. They're all still there. However, what I do think I have more of is one, I have more self confidence. I am doing the things I, I say I will. That's a big difference. So many of us, when we're dealing with porn, we're not doing what we say we will with it. We say, oh, I'm going to quit or this is the last time. Or even what we want our ch children to do, yeah, right? right? Like we don't want our kids viewing porn, but right. then we are secretly doing it. Yeah, you know? right. So in that sense, there's a whole lot more self confidence. There's, there's a confidence that I am a good human and that I'm being the person that I expect myself to be. And I think that that's probably the biggest shift for me. If I think about everything else that's going on in life, nothing became so easy that porn like solved everything. I do think that because of this trial, you and I were able to grow so much more than we may have done otherwise. And I don't know, everybody has their trials. This one's ours. I don't think I would want someone else's trials. I'm not picking anything else. Mm -hmm. And this has been a really great catalyst for us to learn and grow together and do the work that we needed to do to become the couple that we are now who really enjoy each other. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> That's her ascent that she I'm like, me. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So just a few more. Yeah. Uh, what ongoing practices or habits do you maintain to support your life from going back to pornography? Yeah, how do I keep from going back to pornography? Well, I think I, I always tell this to my clients. I tell this to people whenever they're talking about, okay, how do I make this stop? 
what you have to do, what I had to do was I had to make my responses to my brain habitual. Every single thing that we do in this world, our brain does one of two things with it. It's either learning it fresh, so it's creating a habit or it's running a habit. So if you think about your very first day driving to work, you got to figure out where to turn, you got to figure out where to park, you got to figure out which part of the building to go in, where your desk is, all of those things. By you know day 200, it's a habit. Everything that you do, you get in your car from the time you leave your house to the time you sit down at your desk, you think about whatever you want to think about, you don't think about that journey. And this is a key to anybody who wants to put porn behind them in a permanent way. It's habitually addressing the story and the negative feelings that are coming up before your brain starts to offer you. Habitually learning how to do that, habitually learning how to make that part of your brain. So you're going to have to practice off game. And when I say practice off game, what I mean is if you want to be great at shooting free throws, you have to practice before practice. You have to practice after practice. You have to practice outside of practice. And then when you get to the game and you've been fouled and it's time to shoot a free throw, everything's automatic. Everything happens automatically and it's habitual in a free throw. You got to do that same thing with porn. You got to do that same thing with what your brain is offering you and why it's offering you porn. All right. Last question. If you could go back and give your younger self advice regarding pornography, what would you say? I mean, the very first thing that I would say is, yep. I mean, this is kind of how we talk to our kids. Yes, that's going to be interesting to you. And there are going to be things that happen within your body that make that exciting. There are going to be things that are a part of what you want this to look like. You also need to recognize that this is not how women really feel when it comes to meaningful sexual interaction. So, you know, the way that people portray themselves within pornography, the way that people choose to interact within pornography is not how real meaningful relationships actually look. And what you really want to do, and this is again, this is how we talk to our kids. What you want to do is you want to ask yourself, do I want something that's fake or do I want something that's real? Is this in my values or is it outside my values? How do I want to approach this so that I can be the person that I expect myself to be? How do I want to approach this so that I can grow into the man that I want to be? And I think taking away all that blame and shame and freaking out that I found out that my body feels good, taking all of that away would have made enormous difference in my life. It would have made it so that I didn't feel ashamed most of the time when I thought about sexuality. I fully recognize that nobody gets out of childhood without trauma. So the reality is I would have probably had some other problem that I had to deal with. So I'm not discounting that reality, but what I would want me to know is that I'm enough and that I'm okay. And that seeing these things doesn't make me a terrible human, but it does make me not be the person that I expect myself to be when I'm 40 and I'm living with a beautiful woman who loves me and really wants me to give myself to her instead of going out and seeking something that isn't reciprocal. It's fake. It's, it's Cheetos. It's not a good ribeye. I don't know if that's a good analogy. Uh, it's not something that's fulfilling. It's just something to do. All right. I kind of want to answer that last yeah, question. Yeah, you, you answer it. You For tell you. me what you would tell me. Because I think what I would tell your younger self is that you're going to be okay and you're going to figure it out. Because I just imagine and just hearing lots of men's stories throughout the years of doing this work and having these conversations with our friends. I think so many men feel like they're never going to be able to figure it out and that it's just always going to plague them. And, yeah. and so I think that would be my advice to your younger self is that you're going to figure it out and you're going to be OK. And then another thing that came to my mind is listening to you like so much of what could have helped you in those younger years is just healthy sexuality. Yeah. You know, a conversation Having about Having an it. adult who had enough healthy sexuality to have that conversation with me. That's a huge difference. I would say my parents still don't have enough healthy sexuality to have this conversation with me. So it's, it's funny that you say that because I think that's a huge difference. 
between the way that we, you and I were raised and the way that our children are being raised. Yeah, very much so. All right. Well, we're glad you're here. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And next week, Zach is going to ask me questions. So should be exciting. Yeah. Thanks for this. I appreciate it. And if, if you're out there listening and you're saying, hey, this is exactly my story or, or this, this story resonated with me, share it with somebody. Let somebody know that this doesn't have to be doom and gloom. It doesn't have to be the end of the world. It doesn't have to be the destruction of your relationship that you can survive. And not only can you survive through this trial, you can overcome it and be in a relationship that thrives together with somebody who loves you and who you, who you love. Thank you, Zach, for answering these questions. And if you enjoy this podcast, we would love it if you would rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or any other place that you listen to your podcasts. That always brightens my day. I'm like, yeah, we're making a difference for someone. Anyways, so we will talk to you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to Thrive Beyond Pornography. If you're seeking guidance and support to overcome pornography for good and begin creating a thriving life beyond it, Check out my free webinar, How to Overcome Pornography with Skills That Actually Work. You'll learn practical, proven skills guided by an expert coach who has personally overcome pornography. Whether you're getting started for just yourself or along with your spouse, Darcy and I can teach you the tools that will help you put your life on the right path for you. Be sure to check out the show notes for a direct link. And if you could take a moment to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, it would mean the world to us. Your reviews play a significant role in helping others discover the show so they can join us on this transformative journey. Thank you for being part of the Thrive Beyond Pornography community. Until our next episode, stay strong, stay focused, and keep thriving.